Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I am Sharon Green Middleton, Vice President of the City Council, Representative for the 6th Council District, and Chairperson for the Economic and Community Development Committee. This afternoon, we will hear the following bills. Bill number 22-0287, Bill number 23-0346, and Bill number 22-0296. In attendance, we have members of the committee, John Bullock of the 9th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mark Conway of the 4th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. Odette Ramos of the 14th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Robert Stokes of the 12th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we also have uh, Council Member Eric Costello of the 11th District Thank that you, is Chair. sponsor of two of the bills this afternoon. I was looking to see if there is anybody else here. We have representatives from the Office of the Mayor, Sophia G. And uh, let's begin bill number, with bill number 22-0287, Real Estate Practices, Disclosures, Historic Districts. For the purpose of requiring certain disclosures in order to sell a property that is located in a historic district and providing for certain penalties, this bill was introduced on October 3rd, 2022. Uh, the bill sponsor is Council Member Bullock. Council Member, would you like to um, make a comment? Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for not only recognizing me, but also being a co-sponsor of this bill. Um, just for a point of uh, clarification, I, I do serve as the City Council Representative uh, to CHAP, the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Literally, we just came over from a CHAP hearing, so there's CHAP staff um, that is with us. And one thing I can tell you is that over the course of the several years of being on CHAP, um, there have been numerous occasions when individuals have said, you know, we purchased a house in a historic district, but we had no idea it was an historic district and all the requirements um, that come along with the materials and the cost that comes along with that. And so given that I've seen it happen in the 9th District, 6th District, 1st, and pretty much every district throughout the city, I uh, thought it'd be appropriate to have this kind of disclosure when people are purchasing a property to know exactly what they're getting um, themselves into and what the requirements are. So again, I look forward to a favorable disposition and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Uh, the committee will now hear from agency representatives. Uh, and we'll start with the uh, law department, and we have Hillary Rooley and a Ashley Tuff. Hi, Hillary. Hi. It's Hillary Rooley for the law department. We approve the bill for form and legal sufficiency, so long as there is an amendment added to make sure that it's clear it's not retroactive. So it wouldn't apply if you already have the offer, you know, of sale tied up, so it's, it's only prospective. And other than that, we would approve it for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you. Any questions from the committee to the law department? No. Um, now we'll hear from uh, CHAP. Good afternoon, Stacey Montgomery with CHAP. Uh, this was heard before our commission in November of 2022, and the commission voted in favor with the recommendation that also designated landmarks be added to that. Um, but we think this is really, a really important bill. As Councilman Bullock said, we hear all the time people who've bought properties who didn't know they're in a historic district. It means potentially additional costs, uh, additional permit requirements, things like that. So this is going to help people make an informed decision because they're going to need to find out about um, the historic designation prior to signing their contract so they're aware they can decide if this is what they want to do, if they want to live here, and go into it knowing um, what, what they're getting into. And so that, we hope, will also help decrease the number of violations we get as a result of that. We just think it's a really, really positive thing we've been hoping for for a long time. Um, and we'd just like to also say that we're going to be producing some information to help folks uh, when they go through this process to understand what it means to be in a historic district. So when they um, sign that contract, they can look and see what does that mean, or when they get this disclosure, they can understand through the disclosure what they're getting into ahead of time. So we're working on some of that material right now. Uh, but our commission voted in support of that as well. Thank you.
Any questions to chat? <laughs> Councilman Stokes. You no, know, um, thanks for explaining that so people understand exactly what this bill does. Thank you. Planning Commission. Eric Tiso. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the uh, committee. This bill was reviewed by the Planning Commission in their meeting of November 17th, and they recommend favorable. Thank you. Uh, BMZA. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. This is Sophia from the Mayor's Office of Government Relations. BMZ stands by its report and as a quasi-judicial uh, agency is not providing a report on this. Thank you. Thank you. And Department of Housing and Community Development, Stephanie Murdoch. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Stephanie Murdoch, Director of Legislative Services for DHCD. We appreciate the opportunity to review the proposed legislation, which we believe will help inform purchasers of property in historic districts. We are also in support of the amendments discussed by the Law Department, as well as CHAP. We stand by our bill report and defer to CHAP on the passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the Baltimore Development Corporation, Dave Garza. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Baltimore Development Corporation stands by its uh, report, and we support Council Bill 220287. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just so you know, we were just really getting clarification with each other about the amendment, and um, I think we want to make sure we have that ready before we um, bring this to second reader. Can you just explain the amendment as well? Sure. So the recommendation was also to include um, individual sites that are designated as Baltimore City landmarks so they are not within historic districts. This bill was for historic districts specifically, but also to include individually, there's about 200 individually designated buildings throughout Baltimore City. Um, that So if a person bought one of those buildings as well, they'd also be informed of that since it's not within a historic district. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councilman Stokes, you have a question. Sure. Can you give us a list once this is passed and amendment? of those historical and the landmark, so at least the community or whoever want to purchase in that community, at least they know what both um, what properties are historical and what uh, um, landmark, same thing. Yes, that would sure. be more for the community to understand exactly when they purchase in property, what they purchase in, what is historical and what is landmark. Yes, Thank you, Madam Chair. So send that to um, Mr. Peters that staffs this committee, okay. and um, he'll make sure it gets to all the council members okay. uh, before second reader. Okay. Madam, Madam Chair. Just uh, yes, Councilwoman Ramos. Um, do, do you have specific language that you're interested in making sure this goes in? Because you sort of said just, you know, is it just the historic landmark list, the historic landmark? Yes. I, I can provide specific language if that would be helpful. Yeah, but we don't have it right now. We just, that was a recommendation that was done at the commission hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're good? Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I guess we're ready for public testimony. The committee will now take public testimony. If you are online and would like to test the, hmm? 
I'm sorry. If you would like, if you are online and would like to testify on this bill, please use the raised hand button to let us know. I'll start with those who have signed in to testify in person. And looking down the list, I don't see anyone listed for this bill. Is there someone that would like to testify in person on this particular bill? And seeing none, we'll now go to online attendees. We will now call all attendees online who have their hands raised. And we don't see any hands raised for this bill. And now we'll go to telephone callers. <coughs> and we have no callers on this bill. Are there any final comments on this bill from the committee? Is there a motion to move the Commission of Historical and Architectural Preservation's amendment? So moved. moved by Conway. Second. Second by Bullock. All those, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Is there a motion for the Law Department's amendment? So moved. So moved by Bullock, second by Middleton. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Hearing none, is, a, is there a motion to rec recommend the bill favorable as amended? So moved, so moved by Conway, second by um, Stokes. Chair Middleton, yes. Bullock, yes. Yes. Conway, yes. is it yes? Dorsey, absent. Um, member of the committee, uh, Glover is present. Are you a, a yes on this bill? Thank you. Ramos, yes. is a yes. Stokes, is a yes, this bill will move to second reader at the next council meeting, and we will get, um, have a copy of the amendments at that council meeting. Thank you. The next bill, bill number 23-0346, RPP area 48 Riverside revisions for the purpose of modifying the hours of applicable parking restrictions for residential parking plan area 48 Riverside, reducing the non-permit parking time threshold, establishing a exemption to applicable permit limit and correcting and conforming related provisions. This bill was introduced on January 23rd, 2023. The bill sponsor is council member um, Costello, Council Member Costello, would you like to comment about the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, these are uh, two administrative modifications to the Residential Permit Parking, or RPP, uh, program in Area 48 in the Riverside community. Uh, this is the newest RPP area in the city. Uh, this area was established uh, through the major change process of a petition. Uh, the community worked tirelessly on establishing this RPP area over a three-year period. Uh, this uh, bill does two things. Uh, it removes the two hour no permit required window during RPP hours. Uh, and it also starts parking restrictions at 6 p.m. rather than 5 p.m. on Monday through Saturday and at 2 p.m. rather than 1 p.m. Uh, on Sunday. Uh, and this bill is supported by the Riverside Neighborhood Association as well as Mr. Jeff Brown, uh, who is the architect of uh, the RPP area in area 48 uh, and as the parking chair for the Riverside Neighborhood Association, I respectfully ask for the committee's favorable consideration of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, the committee will now hear from the agency representatives. We'll start again with the law department. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michelle Toth on behalf of the law department. We stand by our bill report approving for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you, Michelle. Planning Department. And good afternoon, Eric T. So for planning, we have no objection. Defer to Parking Authority. Thank you. Transportation. Madam Chair, Liam Davis, Baltimore City Department of Transportation. We stand by our bill report, which is no objection. Thank you. Uh, 
It's police department. Oh, I'm sorry. Your mic is off. <laughs> Could you repeat oh, that? Oh, it's the other button. I should know this from the budget hearing. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Aaron Murphy, on behalf of the Baltimore Police Department, um, we stand by our bill report and have no objection. Thank you. And the Parking Authority. Thank you, Madam Chair. Christmas Age Parking Authority of Baltimore City, we stand by our bill report, which is not opposed. Thank you. Any comments or questions so far? Moving forward, the committee will now take public testimony. If you are online and would like to testify on this bill, please use the raise hand button to let us know. But I'll start with uh, people that have signed in. And we have no one that has signed in. Is there anyone that wants to testify on this bill that uh, forgot to sign in? OK, seeing none, we'll go to online attendees. Um, checking. And raise your hand if you want to testify on this bill. Barbara Samuels. Barbara Samuels, are you online? The next, next bill. The next bill, okay. Um, telephone callers, unmute yourself now if you want to testify on this parking bill. And we have none. Do, member, do committee members have any questions or comments? And we have no amendment on this bill. Is there a motion to recommend the bill favorable? So moved. So moved second. by Councilman Bullock and a second by Councilman Conway, Chair Middleton, yes. Bullock? Yes. Yes. Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Dorsey absent. Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Ramos? Yes. Is a yes. And Stokes? Yes. Is a yes. This bill will move to second reader at the next council meeting. Uh, the next bill, bill number 22-0296, rezoning 810 Leadenhall Street for the purpose of changing the zoning for the property known as 810 Leadenhall Street, block 0902, lot 006, as outlined in red on the accompanying plat from the IMU-1 zoning district to the TOD-4 zoning district. This bill was introduced on November 7th, 2022. This bill was sponsored by council member uh, Costello, council member, comments. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate the committee's consideration of this bill today. Um, this is a uh, proposed rezoning of a currently vacant uh, warehouse property with the exception of one uh, commercial tenant, which takes up a small portion of the existing uh, ground floor retail uh, on the uh, east side of the property. Um, I was first approached by the property owner uh, about a request for rezoning uh, back in the fall of 2023. Uh, this property is in a unique location in that it's sandwiched in between the Sharp Leadenhall and Otterbein communities, uh, but is not claimed uh, by either of those uh, respective uh, community associations slash HOAs. Um, I uh, had an initial meeting uh, with a few community leaders to discuss the project back on October 6th. Uh, when I met with the um, property owner and proposed redevelopment team, uh, we had a long conversation about what my expectations were uh, in order to be able to move forward with the request for rezoning. Uh, and that included extensive community outreach and having meaningful conversations with the community. I'm pleased to report that I believe that work has happened. I hosted uh, community-wide meetings, which ranged in attendance from 50 to maybe 80 people for each of the three meetings. I hosted a meeting on October 6th of 2022, and I apologize before I said fall of 23, I meant fall of 22. Uh, apparently budget hearings have gotten to me and I've forgotten what year I'm in. Uh, <laughs> we held a second community meeting uh, on, uh, I believe, 
February 19th and a third one uh, on April 19th. Um, during those meetings, a number of issues uh, were raised, uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, the development team has made a number of modifications uh, to address uh, community concerns, uh, which we heard during these meetings, uh, which I think uh, help improve the proposed project. Those include uh, pulling upper floors away from the property edge, uh, providing a shade study showing minor impacts, uh, relocating a garage entrance from Peach Street to Leadenhall Street, um, committing to study elevations uh, uh, to mitigate uh, some of these issues, um, setting back a garage door to increase safety. Uh, it's important to note that the uh, surrounding area uh, is sandwiched by either Area 8 RPP parking, which is Otterbein, or Area 9 RPP parking, which is Federal Hill. Uh, so the uh, vehicles of residents would not be permitted to park uh, in those RPP uh, areas. There have been a number of other concessions made. Um, there was a request from the community to downgrade the zoning from TOD4 uh, to TOD3, which I would respectfully request for the committee's consideration. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you for having uh, that amendment drafted up for the committee's consideration this mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, I'm also uh, very pleased to report uh, that the uh, group behind the project um, has recognized that there would be some impact from uh, the uh, additional usage of a number of parks in Otterbein, uh, and they have committed uh, to a long-term maintenance agreement uh, with the community association to support that, as well as uh, direct support for uh, a group uh, in the Sharp Leaden Hall community that does youth mentoring. Uh, so I'm very pleased uh, with what uh, this group's commitment has been to the neighborhood so far. Uh, and for these reasons, uh, I would ask for uh, favorable consideration of the bill uh, with uh, the proposed amendment that you have, Madam Chair. I know, one last thing, I know that we are going to uh, be talking extensively about findings of facts. Uh, as the city council representative uh, to the planning commission, I was engaged in those discussions. Uh, and I know that there is a robust set of findings of fact that were proposed by Commissioner Tom Previs, uh, which I am sure Deputy Director uh, Eric Tizo will be discussing uh, at length today. And again, wanna thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing and wanna thank my colleagues for their consideration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Member Costello. I know that you uh, had several cancellations in order to uh, try to iron out some of the differences with communities. And as I mentioned, this bill was introduced way back in November of 2022. Um, I also shared, uh, committee members should have on your desk the amendment uh, that basically um, on page one in lines five to 14 and uh, strike TOD four and substitute TOD three. So that is a uh, correction there. And as council member Costello mentioned, uh, there was a negotiation for about parks and also um, a group youth mentoring uh, initiative that um, has proven to be successful. And on that note, the committee will now hear from agency representatives, and we'll start with the Law Department. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michelle Toth on behalf of the Law Department, and we stand by our bill report. Thank you. Any questions at this point from committee members? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, thank you. It, it's approved for form and legal sufficiency. Correct. Thank you. Uh, BMZA, that's the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, BMZA is deferring to Planning Commission for its report. Thank you. And we'll go with the Planning Commission. And good afternoon, Eric Tiso for the Planning Commission. Uh, this bill was reviewed in their hearing of February 9th, and I can give you a little bit of the background um, on the analysis that uh, the Planning Commission relied on. 
so looking at the, the history of the property under the prior zoning code, which existed before 2017, uh, the property was zoned M22 heavy industrial, uh, though that was not a large industrial district. It was just that property recognizing uh, the uses and the construction that existed at that time. Uh, with a comprehensive citywide rezoning uh, that uh, went into effect in 2017, it became IMU, which is industrial mixed use, uh, recognizing uh, its industrial origins but allowing some future flexibility of use. A couple years later, we realized that the IMU district kind of had two characters to it. Some that were the industrial lighter type uses that were embedded in neighborhoods because historically that's where they were and they were surrounded by neighborhoods and that's where their workforce came from, uh, but they were more industrial and needed to be preserved as industrial type uses. Um, because IMU allowed residential, sometimes a conversion of those uh, was not appropriate. So we split it into IMU 1, which allowed for residential use, that's what this property got, and IMU 2, which kept the more industrial character. Um, so that kind of confirm the shifting uh, towards the, the residential um, type use of this. Uh, so while we uh, look at that trend, that's one of the, the factors that you need to look at, as well as uh, needs of the city and the neighborhood in particular, um, the department generally, and me specifically in person, tends to defend um, intrusion in industrial districts uh, wherever that makes sense to do so. In this case, it's a standalone property surrounded by residential uh, with the nearest zones uh, being commercial or office residential. The nearest industrial is about five blocks away. Uh, within three blocks uh, is additional TOD4 uh, land that's a multi-block area that's about equidistant to the transit stop. Uh, so to us, that makes sense. Um, and with the proposal to uh, instead rezone to TOD3, just by way of background, there are four uh, transit-oriented development TOD districts. One and two are the lower 60-foot height zones. One has uh, a lighter mix of uses, two has a heavier mix. Uh, for three and four, those are the higher, uh, up to 100 feet construction. Again, three has the lighter use mix, four has the heavier use mix. So you can kind of mix and match depending on when you want tall, short, heavy uh, use, or lighter use. Uh, so shifting to TOD3 would limit some of the uses, uh, but we understand that this is a residential project that's proposed, so that would be thoroughly appropriate. Um, again, when the Planning Commission looks at things, they're obligated to look at the generic rezoning, but we know that there is a particular project uh, attached to this. Um, there's more detail uh, in our staff report of, of how we believe that this meets all of the considerations uh, that are called for in state law and in the zoning code. Uh, we believe that this uh, makes sense uh, to adopt uh, the, the proposal to go to TOD3 instead, um, and the Planning Commission recommended favorable. Thank you. Any questions to the Planning Commission? Uh, Madam Chair. Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a couple of questions about TOD3 in general. What does light retail mean versus heavy mixes? Um, okay. Sure, so let me pull up. Okay, so if you look at the back of the zoning code, um, table 12402 is the grid that has the various uses. Right. Uh, so uh, comparing the two, um, there's a variety of things like art studio, industrial, uh, banquet halls that could be in TOD4 that cannot be in three, um, entertainment, live entertainment, indoor entertainment. Um, would oh, I understand. Eligible. Just to interrupt you. So we would sure. look at the chart to see what um, right. is permitted and what's not permitted. So for instance, uh, banquet hall is not permitted in an O3 unless, and it's permitted in a TOD4 if it's conditional by ordinance. So that, that's really the designation there is yep. looking at the chart. It's, it's okay. use district, uh, mm -hmm. use difference. Um, the district's uh, bulk standards are otherwise the same. Right, so the height can be the same and then right. the area in the, um, the square footage and all, and all of that, that right. and the setbacks are the same. So the only difference between TOD three and four is the, the types of uses the use in the retail mix. space. That's okay. It. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to transportation. Madam Chair, Liam Davis, Baltimore City Department of Transportation. We stand by our bill report, which is no objection. Thank you. Uh, housing. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Stephanie Murdoch, Legislative Liaison for the Department of Housing and Community Development. We stand by our bill report. We do not object to the passage of this bill. Thank you. BDC. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Luis Cardona with the Baltimore Development Corporation. PDC stands by its report in support of this bill. Thank you. And the Parking Authority. Thank you, Madam Chair. Christmas Age Parking Authority of Baltimore City. We stand by our bill report, which is not opposed. Thank you. Any questions thus far from the committee? Madam Chair, I have a couple of questions for the sponsor, if that's okay. Sure. Um, sponsor. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, um, I guess I have to call you Mr. Chair as well. <laughs> um, I had a question about, uh, it, it's great that there's been so much discussion with the community about um, this particular project. Was there any commitment to any affordable units um, in the building? So the, um, the property owner and development team have agreed to comply with any legal requirements by the city of Baltimore with respect to affordable housing. Um, so that would mean uh, at the moment they're not required to do any affordable housing based on inclusionary housing law, but if the law passes but at a certain time that they would comply. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, does this building have tax credits on it? I guess it does if they would have to comply with the law that we've drafted. There are currently no tax credits on this property. Do they plan on applying for credits? There is what's known as a matter of right uh, credit. It's the high performance market rate credit. Uh, this project would apply for that as matter of right credit. Thank you. Um, and so going back just in terms of the timing, what is the, the timing on development here? Just because I want to get a sense of whether or not we'll be able to even pass our bill uh, to be able to have this comply with uh, inclusionary. Madam Chair, I would offer up that that's a separate matter. That's not within the scope of this hearing. Uh, but the development team, I believe they have legal counsel here who will be testifying on behalf of them, would be better positioned to answer any questions related to the timing. But again, for the chair's consideration, I would offer up that that's not germane to the scope of today's conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions, just like I would ask in any other um, hearing. So thank you. I'll wait for the development team. Thanks. Okay. The committee will now take public testimony. If you're online and would like to testify on this bill, please use the raise hand button to let us know. Just a reminder. But we're going to go ahead and start with people that have signed up to testify. And we have a list here, and I apologize if uh, I pronounce your name wrong. So we're going to start with the people that have checked off to testify, and the first one that I see a check by is Robin Ryder. Yes. Yeah. Press push that button that has the on the right hand side. So, thank you, ah, there thank we you, go. Eric. Uh, with the units, the uh, work one one at uh, Lynn Hall Street. How many units will be there, and will it be enough room for cars? At least a hundred or more. Could you just state your name and oh, who you represent? Ryder, and I represent a resident of the Federal Hill area. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. And when this work is done. Will they sort of set some need to go into the existing one in Sharpland Hall area or a new one we replaced it? Are you asking a question or just I'm asking a question about the building when it goes up. So basically um, we're just giving you're giving public testimony. Yes. So we'll um, hold off a question unless you Okay. You uh, repeat his question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the gentleman asked a question about if there would be enough parking spaces in the building for all of the units that would be in the building? 
And the, the answer, I believe, is yes. I'll, I'll uh, defer to the development team to expand on the specific details. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, is that all you just wanted to wanted that question answered? Was there any other statement you wanted to add? Uh, will the sewer lines coming from this building be placed into the existing sewer lines in the area, or will, will they be updated? So, oh, so we, I think you asked, will the, will the existing sewer lines, the existing city sewer lines be utilized for this building? Yes. Yes. Um, existing uh, water uh, sanitary, which is sewer, and storm water would be utilized uh, by any property that, that would be redeveloped. But... The, the building currently has water, sanitary, and storm water, and the building currently uses those, line, those what are known as tie-ins to connect to the mains uh, underneath the street. So the, the short answer is yes, sir. Uh, do you know the age of that line? Uh, I do not know the age of that line. All right, thank you. So, um, Mr. Ryder, are you, because really we want testimony, you're either for or against. against. But and then you I can, talk to them. and then I'm sure the council person will let you talk to the developer for further questions. Thank you kindly. Okay. Next we have um, uh, Andrew Forbes. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Andrew Forbes. I live at 117 West Montgomery Street. I am an adjacent property owner directly north of 810 Leadenhall Street. I oppose the rezoning of 810 Leadenhall Street. I believe that the legal justification to allow rezoning of 810 Leadenhall Street has not been met. Uh, but I feel that doesn't really matter here today because this is not a courtroom and I believe that each and every council member present today will ultimately vote yes for the rezoning of 810 Leadenhall Street to TOD3. Uh, I believe this because Baltimore is a city in great need of investment and redevelopment, and I recognize the sentiment in these times of need is that growth should be prioritized at all costs. I provide a written testimony to this committee detailing the numerous inconsistencies and unsubstantiated generalizations contained within the Planning Commission's report re recommending rezoning of the property. I will not repeat that testimony here today because I think those details are more suited to a courtroom. Uh, but you, the City Council of Baltimore, have a duty to grow the city, and the decision here today is about growing our city by maximizing density and investment. Now, I am here today because the decision made to rezone the property will grant the developer the right to increase the adverse impacts of the project on my property and my neighbor's properties. By way of rezoning, the developer is receiving a new entitlement today free of charge. This new entitlement will allow the developer the right to create a building nearly twice the size of what is allowed under the existing IMU zoning. The developer will receive a windfall of profits from rezoning free of charge. As a result of rezoning, my property and 10 of my neighbor's properties will be adversely impacted in far greater ways than if a building was constructed under the current zoning. These adverse impacts being forced upon us by the developer are permanent and will reduce the value of my property and my neighbor's properties. As a result of rezoning, the developer will make more money and the existing homeowners will lose money. The rezoning and redevelopment of 810 Leadenhall Street is fundamentally inequitable. This inequitable outcome affecting my property and 10 of my neighbors' properties can be addressed equitably. My neighbors and I have identified two specific, actionable, and very reasonable project conditions that will minimize and mitigate the adverse impacts of the redevelopment on our properties. Now, these project conditions we have identified will allow the developer to meet the stated number of units plan for the redevelopment 
as a result of the rezoning, thus maximizing the benefits of density and investment to the city of Baltimore. And I have just recently shared this request with the developer, and we are hoping to reach an agreement of implementation with the developer of these two conditions. Now, what I ask of City Council today, if you vote yes to approve the rezoning of 810 Lenhall Street and grant this valuable new entitlement to the developer, will you please show your support of the adjacent homeowning, taxpaying citizens of Baltimore by letting the developer know that with this new profit-boosting privilege they have received today, free of charge, that there is an obligation to do right by their neighbors and redevelop this project equitably. Myself and my neighbors, we love Baltimore, and we want to be part of growing this amazing city. And we're taking one for Team Baltimore and absorbing incredibly adverse impacts of this redevelopment project in an effort to help grow this city. I'm asking you to show the people of Baltimore and your constituents that equitable development is the right way to grow our city. If you vote yes on rezoning 810 Leadenhall Street, I ask you to tell the developer today that they are expected to deliver an equitable project for their neighbors and for this city. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Bonnie Costner, longtime resident of South Baltimore. We bought our house in 1985, and we were surrounded by industrial buildings, many of whom have since been purchased and converted to high-rise apartments. There are now four high-rise apartments within two blocks of my home. I can no longer see the sunsets, and the traffic around my neighborhood has increased dramatically. Rezoning in South, in uh, Sharp Leadenhall area will just bring more of this. I understand the need for development and investment, but I believe it's my perspective that the Baltimore City and even uh, the Community uh, Council, um, I mean Community Development, are giving preference to new developers and people who are just out to make a buck without giving consideration to the people who have lived here forever. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, I am a longtime resident of the Sharp Leeden Hall community and also a member of the inclusionary housing. I want you to know that black neighborhoods do matter. I do not support this zoning. And let me share with you briefly why. Not enough consideration or engagement has been made with the historic Sharp Latin Hall community. We've heard our council person talking about some lawns are gonna be taken care of by the developer in Audubon, which already has amenities to take care of that. We've also heard the council person mention that there is a program that deals with children in Sharp Hall, which is well in need of continued support. But we also have residents that live in Sharp Hall who are gonna be greatly impacted by this development. This building is over or nearly 100 years old. We have not heard what the environmental study has said about this building. More importantly, since the zoning has been changed from the IMU-1 to the uh, TOD-4, which we didn't support, even the TOD-3 still does not help the real issue here for residents in our community who are working class citizens and some low income citizens that there is no affordability in this project. So with the increase uh, or the change in the zoning, which will allow for more density, I'm quite concerned if there's not a law in place, it is very clear developers do not voluntarily put in affordability. So my strong recommendation to this council, and I think it's been said already, it's a good chance decisions have already been made. I want you to know that this type of bill will also affect working class families who are finding it very difficult to survive. You understand what I'm saying? Very difficult to survive. 
It was said at a rally that we held yesterday by one of the nearby residents, only 30% as a suggestion of your income should go towards your rent. These one and two bedroom luxury apartments are forcing our moderate income properties to increase their rent to a higher market rate, which is putting enormous financial difficulties on families who are already struggling. Not only are they struggling financially, but just the pressure of possibly being forced out of your community in which you have lived there for generations is alarming. People are going to bed at night not sure how long am I going to be able to stay in a community that I have raised my children in, that I've had great memories in, how long. I think the developer is one of the most approachable developers I've ever met. Uh, he's a very nice guy. I think our council person is also a very nice guy. But I think one of the problems here, you're not talking to the people. You have not talked to me. You haven't talked to me, Eric. There are needs that our community has that could be benefit from some benefit agreement with the developer. You haven't talked to me. Doug, I've talked to you several times. I continue to say affordability is needed. How much profit do you need at the basis of the lives that you can impact? I know I've said several things here. I talked about the environment. I'm very concerned if this building is torn down in an area that is historic. This donut is just so small. The historic buildings around it are within a half a block. Our historic designation is across the street. It's not even 50 feet. This building is greatly going to impact on the preservation efforts that we have made for years to try to keep our community relevant, to keep our community safe. When you add possibly 500 residents, 300 residents, you're adding more pressure. I think as the first speaker shared about the impact it's going to have on our existing resources that we have, our storm drains, our plumbing, and so forth. The thing that we haven't talked about enough is about the environment. You know, are you going to plant more trees? How much of a setback is there going to be? Right across the street, less than 100 feet, are townhouses where children live. We've had some new babies born, praise God, in the community. What is going to be the impact when this building possibly is torn down if measures aren't taken to keep that air as safe as possible? With our plans of affordability, being made and a commitment, a sincere commitment being made, no congestion, no sessions, no compromise is worth the lives of the people in the community. What do we want? We want some affordability. When do we want it? We want it now. Our inclusionary law cannot be passed fast enough to impact on this building. But what we do here is going to set the framework what will continue to happen in our community of Sharp Leaden Hall as also in our nearby community in Audubon. We have people that are planning to move because of the impact of this construction. I think people would stay longer in Baltimore City if Baltimore City was more inclusive of all the needs of its people, regardless of their race, regardless of their income. If you don't feel included, you felt left out. And if you feel left out, you don't feel as committed. I wonder, do you really care? What do we need? We need affordability. When do we need it? We need it now. Thank you. Hi. My name is Bridget Purcell. I live at 808 Leadenhall Street. I've come today to respectfully request that you vote against the bill to rezone 810 Leadenhall Street. I come as a concerned resident of Baltimore, as an owner of an adjacent property that will be directly impacted by the development, and as a social scientist with expertise in the socioeconomic and demographic impacts of urban redevelopment. I'd like to make three points. First, the proposed bill does not meet the legal standards necessary for spot zoning to be considered lawful. 
The applicant has failed to provide evidence of either a mistake in the existing zoning or a substantial change in the character of the immediate neighborhood since the last comprehensive rezoning in 2017. Other community members with career expertise in law, planning, and permitting have submitted written testimony detailing the inaccuracies and generalizations in the Planning Commission's report in order to accommodate the developer's request. I won't recite those arguments here, but I ask, why do the financial interests of a developer matter more than the law? Second, the proposed bill benefits the developer at the expense of the surrounding community. The law department notes that lawful piecemeal zoning must be shown to promote, quote, the public health, safety, morals, or general welfare, and not merely advantage the property owner. It is not clear what benefit, if any, the rezoning will have for Baltimore or surrounding residents. Indeed, the extraordinary high density and permitted uses of TOD4 are profoundly incongruous with the existing material and social fabric of the surrounding communities and will permanently harm both our financial interests and our quality of life. We've pressed these concerns repeatedly in community meetings with the developer and with Representative Costello, at a June 12th rally in defense of Sharp Leaden Hall, in the letter to the Planning Commission signed by 183 community members in the immediate vicinity, and in nearly three hours of public testimony during the Planning Commission hearing on February 9th. So I ask you, why doesn't any of this matter? Why do the interests, the financial interests of a developer matter so much more than the combined interests of the taxpaying members of this community? The answer to many of you will be clear. Baltimore, we are told, is in dire straits. We need investment, we need growth, apparently at all costs. This logic was made explicit in this forum last week when the BMZA executive director was admonished for her efforts to follow the law with respect to zoning, thus impeding developers and others who had come to expect a rubber stamp for their zoning requests. The message to her and to us was clear. We must prioritize density and investment above all else. So third and finally, as a cultural anthropologist, I implore you to consider what we lose when we see development only through the narrow lens of economic growth. One of the immediate social consequences is the displacement of marginalized communities. The development of A10 Leaden Hall will cater to young, affluent, and predominantly white renters. The consequences for Sharp Leaden Hall, a historic, encircled African-American community, are not difficult to predict. And there's no need to predict, because members of this community have told us again and again the threats they face from this development. They speak from long and painful experience, and their warnings are corroborated both by social science and by demographic trends that are already underway. Between 2010 and 2020, the population of Sharp Leaden Hall has grown by a striking 53% as a result of new high rent constructions. Virtually all of the growth was among white households. While black households comprised 68% of the population in 2010, they now comprise just 45%. The trend is clear. Rising property values and skyrocketing rents will displace long-standing residents, breaking social ties and fracturing the fabric of the community. This will not only disrupt the lives of individuals and families, but will erode the collective memory and cultural heritage embedded in this neighborhood. The multiracial, cross-class interactions that now mark my everyday life, that I would argue actually make Baltimore great, will gradually be erased. This is what we lose when we let one narrow vision of economic development dictate the planning of our city. We will all be infinitely poorer. None of this is necessary or inevitable. We can have growth and fairness, but it requires us to take a stand against the unchecked prioritization of profits over people. It requires holding developers accountable to the law and accountable to communities. And it requires you, our representatives, to stand with us to protect our interests and to include us meaningfully in decision-making processes. So I ask you to stand with us today and to deny this request. Thank you. Joe Woolman.
Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize, I couldn't quite hear you. Um, oh, sorry. My name is Joe Woolman. I'm a local land use attorney here on behalf of the development team. Mr. Doug Schmidt from Workshop Development is also here with me. I'm happy to defer to the rest of the neighbors if you would like to take all the neighbors' testimony together and then, and then we'd be happy to, to speak afterwards. However you wish to proceed is fine with us. I'll go ahead and finish the um, testimony and then you can speak afterwards. Very well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Derek. McCorvey, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Derek McCorvey. Excuse me, excuse me, Derek McCorvey. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Derek McCorvey. Uh, before I, well, so I'm a part of the Liberty Heights Coalition, the Hanlon Association, the Southwest Partnership, and a number of other organizations. Before I uh, get into my prepared remarks, I wanna point out a few things that I heard in other people's testimonies. They have a lack of faith in the process. Some of them have already pointed out that it's a foregone conclusion that you all have already reached a decision. So I am hurt in hearing that, and I would hope that you have heard that as well. And, hold on, let me get this unlocked again. So at the end of 2019, I became a homeowner in Baltimore City in Hanlon. Uh, three months later, my house became unaffordable to me. So if I had bought my house three months later, I wouldn't, or tried rather, I wouldn't have been able to afford it because prices went up dramatically. Uh, I graduated from UMBC. Uh, and when I was in attending UMBC, it was called a up and coming school for the entire time I was there for three years. It became a joke amongst us. It was like, when will we arrive? We're always up and coming. Uh, in my attendance at UMBC, I was a part of this program called SBOP. It's the Spring Break Urban Plunge. A part of, um, as our part of our work in that program, we would work with local organizations and local residents in Baltimore City. We would listen to their stories, we would listen to their vision, and we would work with them, helping them to execute their plans. A lot of time people think they are the subject matter experts because they're college students or they work for so-and-so, but the true experts are those who live in the communities uh, because they have the experiences and they also have the professional expertise. Uh, and I'm happy to say that some of the uh, people who went to that program are actually now Baltimore City residents. So they moved from all across the country, some moved across uh, the world to live in Baltimore City as a result of that program. Uh, so I chose to, live to, uh, to move to Baltimore City because of that program, because of uh, employment that I have found here, but also because of the connections with the people and the neighbors that, that I met. Uh, this past Sunday, I actually heard a message, uh, and that message talked about a group of people who uh, traveled together, who learned together, who ate together, and through various circumstances, they were separated from their leader, and when they were united, they did not recognize their leader. So I'll, I'll come to, back to that point. Development and rezoning, these words can invoke fear and anger, but also hope and opportunity to see a vision come to life. I come to you in favor of development, but not in favor of rezoning that ignores my neighbor's pleas. We have a duty to affirmatively affirm fair housing and affordable housing. If changes are to occur, it should only be uh, if affordable housing is included. So today I ask you to get a grip who do you serve? What vision are you trying to execute? Uh, one in which is created by the neighbors or one that is uh, not community driven? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanna make it clear that I, I'm saving the developer for last so he can hear this um, a, a number of the people that are against and what they're saying, and I think he wants to listen as well, so I made the decision to move him last, 
and I have that right to make that decision. The next person is Doug Schmidt. I'm very nice. <laughs> oh, you're a developer as well. I'm, go I'm going down the list so people are kind of mixed up on the list. So we'll save you at the end as well because it's important that we hear what you say after you have listened to what was heard, as we have. Argentina Craig. Thank you. <laughs> ah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council. I stand before you. My name is Argentine Craig, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, Vice President of the City Chapter. I'm also a member of the coalition of 25 community organizations called the Inclusionary Housing Coalition. Many of us are here today to speak, to speak our peace. I am opposed to Bill 220296 for the following reasons. I think it's an anti-Afro-American historical bill. The history of African Americans in this city stem back to the 1700s. Communities, people in this community have raised their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren in what is called a community and all of the components that go into making this section of our city a community. So it's anti-African-American historical position. The second reason that I'm opposed to this 220296 bill is the violation of the TOD. It's illegal. Third reason, it excludes community input. I've heard that the councilman has met with um, members of the community off and on, sporadically, but not the full community. He has not met with the leader of the community. I am fresh from a meeting of that community from last night, less than 24 hours ago. The room that they held in for this community meeting was packed. Members of the community gave testimony to each other about why that community should not be invaded and destroyed. One of the um, reasons when we uh, approached the uh, planning committee uh, a few months ago, uh, the requirement was uh, interaction with the, uh, with the community, wanted community input. And that's what we had. That's what we have. And the fourth reason, it continues the racial divide in city neighborhoods. And the fifth reason, which is all encompassing to me, because we live in a democracy and we are, our processes should support democratic behavior and democratic legislation. This particular bill is anti-democracy. The philosophy that holds up our government, that governs our people, that makes us a community. I oppose 220296 with vigor and passion and hope that you will also not, not vote for it. Thank you. Matt Hill.
Good afternoon, Madam Chair, um, members of the Council. My name is Matt Hill. I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center. And I, I'm struck here today because it seems like normally when I'm in front of you, the Council is dealing with these large, intractable issues of uh, poverty and race, race in a racialized capital, uh, capitalism that's been plaguing us for, for centuries. And that's not the case today. Uh, Ms. Betty's demands, the community's demands, are actually pretty simple, and that is to include affordable units in this development. I'm suggesting that the Council can actually do something about that right now by pausing consideration of this bill about rezoning until it passes the Inclusionary Housing Bill 220195 and mandate the inclusion of affordable units in this development. Now, as I understand it, the hearing should be about the change in the character of the community that justifies this practice of spot zoning. And on the question of change, there's one thing that has not changed since the 2004 master plan, and that's the community's demand for affordable housing included in every new development. Affordable inclusionary housing mitigates the effects of development and reflects what I believe is the council's position that black neighborhoods matter and that we should have development without displacement. So that demand from the sharp Leonard Hall community has not changed since 2004, and again, we suggest that the Council pause its consideration of this bill, first pass the inclusionary housing bill, make sure it's effective, and then that way include affordable units in this plan before the Council gives away this incredible rezoning benefit and the tax credits that are going to follow. My final point is just that this project also shows why it's important for the inclusionary housing bill to be citywide. And that is because you're going to have projects like this on the edge of what are considered stronger markets. And if we want to plan ahead, if we want to make sure that everyone's included, then we need to make sure that every development includes affordable housing. So that's an important point here. And so thank you for your time. Thank you. Timothy Heath. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Timothy Heath, and I live north of the property on Montgomery Street, and I oppose this bill. I have been actively involved with this bill since October, and my interest and participation was focused on ensuring that members of the community were informed about the mechanics of this legislative process and aware of their opportunities to participate throughout the process. This has been a months-long educational and emotional journey for many in the community. Those who are present today and others who could not attend. And today's hearing is a culmination of that journey. And so what I'm here today is to respectfully ask members of this council is that with today's vote, that we make it a continuation of the community's educational development with regards to the city's zoning process. And as such, at the discretion of each council member, I would respectfully encourage you to share your insights as to what guides your vote today so that regardless of the outcome, the community can take with them your expertise and knowledge in this domain, allowing them to seek a more complete sense of closure on this journey and leave these chambers better educated for future legislative participation. Thank you. Mary Bolt, Baltic or Bolt? Bolty. Okay. Mm -hmm. It you can if you'd like. I'm just going down the list. Thank you very much. Um, I live in Otterbein. I moved with my husband from a very nice plush home in Baltimore County for the excitement and of Baltimore City and to be part of this rebirth that we feel like we're seeing. We've been here since 2018. And it, it's it is exciting, it's a rebirth. And we love being in this city. We don't regret one second having made this move. That makes me all the more upset that this is occurring in a way, part of what I didn't have in Greater Towson, I did not have a mix of incomes and races. And I have that here. And the idea of plopping in yet 300 or five, whatever it is, however many more young people, 
who, uh, as we said, young professionals and will be largely white. That is not helping, that's between me and Sharp Leadenhall, and I see it as a detraction to what we're trying to build in South Baltimore, which is an integrated community working together, celebrating together, enjoying the parks together. Um, so I am opposed to this rezoning, and I hope that each one of you will give it deep consideration before you uh, vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Eady. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sonia Eady, and I'm the president of the Poppleton Community Association, president of the Southwest Partnership, and I stand in solidarity with Sharp Latin Hall to preserve the housing integrity of our black neighborhoods, to stop displacement, and to keep our neighborhoods affordable to own and to rent. So I thank you, you know, for having this opportunity to speak today. This is why I oppose this bill. High-rise units changes the identity and culture of a neighborhood. This bill will allow for more transient units with heights, depth, and density. I personally view this as Baltimore City's new redlining. It's both a racist and discriminatory act. There are new upscale luxury apartments. These new upscale luxury apartments seem to be a way that the city is providing those who want to live downtown and near by downtown but can't afford the high rates at, of the condos. The city seems to be using the black and poorer neighborhoods to provide these housing opportunities without any thought of those who live there. Making the neighborhoods better is the language being used, but I ask, better for whom? In my neighborhood of Poppleton, the redevelopment plan was changed from townhomes for home ownership and affordable housing to include a PUD which changed the zoning for heights, depth, and density, causing our neighborhood to become transient and has lowered our property values with adjacent neighborhoods' values increasing. To make matters worse is that the neighbors who were forced out can't afford to come back, even with the 20% subsidized rates. The retail market scheduled to occupy the space has cost the retail market, which is the new market that is proposed to come to this development in Poppleton, is scheduled to occupy the space that has a food cost like Whole Foods and Hearst Tita with a gourmet style prepared foods, causing Poppleton and surrounding neighborhoods still to remain a food desert. There's a planned senior building that most of the city retirees won't be able to afford. It's forcing a new, different lifestyle on people who choose to live in this neighborhood. Taking over our skylines, decreasing our quality of life. So again, I ask, better for whom? Black neighborhoods matter. It's time for you as our council people to see your black city residents as people and vote to stop rezoning our neighborhoods for people who would not bother to live in our neighborhoods if you not made it possible. Thank you. Alan Shapiro. Alan Shapiro. Uh, good morning, actually afternoon. Name is Alan Shapiro. I'm here as a representative 
of the Baltimore Ethical Society, with his, which is part of the Alliance for Inclusional Housing. <clears throat> One thing I'd like to mention is that the contractor has stated publicly that he's not going to uh, comply with inclusionary housing. And if, if, if anything goes through, he should be made to sign on uh, to be part. But the main point I'm here for is that a city is not just how many people uh, it, it has in it and how rich they are. Uh, in, a city is made up of the structure of everyone who is part of it and who believe in the city. And this means people have all kinds of positions in the city, all kinds of jobs. And if they don't have, if they work in the city but can't afford to live in the city, then they can't, won't, are not going to care very much about the city. And so it's up to the city to make sure that there's adequate housing. And it can't just zone for upper middle class. That, that's own, that it does that to its own detriment. And so I think that you, know, you have to remember this when you vote on uh, changes in zoning such as this, and particularly in this case, people who've uh, stated publicly, which the contractor has, that they're not interested in what the, the city plans are. They're gonna do what they're gonna do for maximum money. Thank you. Thank you. So now um, we have Joe Woolman and Doug Schmidt. Who, which one would like to go first? Uh, hold off a second. Your hands raised. Oh, I had. Okay, you didn't check off to testify. You were at the top of the list, but you can come. You can definitely come and testify. Thank you, Madam Chair. I probably didn't have my bifocals on. I apologize. My name is Sharonda Huffman. I'm the um, Director of Housing for Maryland Inclusive Housing, and I um, am a member of the Inclusionary Housing Coalition. And I just want to say that um, the clients that I um, serve are persons with um, disabilities who are non-elderly um, non adults. Um, and it is my understanding that the pro proposed rezoning of 810 Leiden Hall will provide more density without the requirement of affordable units. Um, Transit-oriented development provides access to transit that connects residents to resources and amenities across the city and the region. Um, TODs are generally un, um, unaffordable for low and moderate income households. If a developer is requesting more density, why doesn't this council require the developer to also include um, housing for mixed incomes? Um, tax subsidies should equate um, to um, better representation. Um, this is a great opportunity for this council um, to, uh, to require the developer to set aside at least 10% for lower incomes in compliance with the city's master plan uh, for Sharp Bleeding Hall. And I do think that is a germane um, issue that I didn't see that the Planning Commission had even addressed. Um, Sharp Bleeding Hall is a community who said they want affordable housing and is still a, um, is a, is part of the 2004 master plan. I'm also asking this council to break the status quo and not rubber stand another council person's request if you know it's inequitable. I also noticed that the um, planning department said in their report, um, the ad developer addressed equity by having smaller units. Um, there is a potential gentrification issue um, that was not addressed by the planning department. So if that's not their role, I'm wondering why this um, council does not ask the Office of Equity and Civil Rights to provide their analysis, an unedited analysis, um, from them to determine if this is a good opportunity or are you still um, uh, still providing funds for gentrification. So again, um, my name is Sharonda Huffman and I am not in support of this bill as it's written. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that has not 
signed up that would like to speak? Yes. Your name? Betty. Oh, I did say your name. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, I really um, wanted, most of what I want to say has been... Repeat your name. Oh, sorry, it's Terry Holthouse, okay. and I live in one of the properties that is adjacent to the development. And I, I sort of felt like when I spoke earlier, out of turn, I, I feel like um, it, it's almost like this is a court of law. I know it's not. But I feel like in a court of law, the defendant gets to speak last and rest their case. So I felt like this is just a continuation of this process where the voices of all of the constituents are not being heard, that we don't have the opportunity to rebut what is being said by the developers, and that the people who stand to make millions or whatever off of this project are given priority over the voices of the the residents, the people who don't have inclusive housing, and um, those of us who are going to have a, our property values go down. I've lived in South Baltimore for 30 years. Um, I'm a sixth generation South Baltimorean, and I, I don't feel like I, Otterbein is, and Sharp Leadenhall, the, the neighborhood, the quality of the neighborhood, it's low housing, it's two-story buildings, it's not a six-story apartment building in my backyard. We have a million apartment buildings. I, I don't know why we need more. That is one source of frustration for, for me. And also, I feel like it's very convenient that that little donut of a property was not in anybody's historic district, so people can just do whatever they want. Um, and that it's also convenient that the law expired that doesn't allow for a certain percentage of housing that is affordable for people who have already suffered in that neighborhood for decades being thrown out of their homes. Um, when, I, when I was in college, I knew about the dollar houses. I really didn't understand the implication of that. And now that I live on a street where people were thrown out of their homes, it just feels like, um, like I feel sad about that. There's nothing I can do about it now. But I feel like I can stand here and say, really don't do that again, because it's just not fair to people. So I would really like to see, I feel like at this point, everything is gonna go ahead the way it is. But at the very minimum, there should be something set up for people who can still, who can afford to live there and still live in their neighborhoods. And that's basically it, thank you. Thank you. Any other person that has not signed up? Yes. Quickly, so we can, we still have callers as well. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Taryn Gross O.J. Quay. Um, I didn't prepare to speak today. Um, I'm very, very um, boisterous in a lot of these meetings. Um, Mr. Costello and I have a lot of heated discussions. Um, I moved in Sharp Leaden Hall, 1980, um, 19 years old, um, I'm 63 now. Um, I watched our neighborhood just get eaten up through the years. I was fortunate enough to meet the last of the South Baltimoreans who had history from the late 1700s. I spoke to a lot of these older people, and um, I had no idea that that was the oldest black community in Baltimore City, where a lot of people do not know. I have people who walk past my house and look at me and with this look of, what are you doing here? So I engage them. I tell them about the history of our community. We have alleged cousins of Frederick Douglass just around the corner. We um, have done digs. We um, are in a process of looking into tunnels that was built in our community going up to Lexington Market. Um, also, we are looking into facts with Harriet Tubman um, having um, something to do with our community. A lot of Elijah Cummins 
lived two doors away from Betty Bland Thomas. It's an article in, about the Riverside Pool, um, about um, uh, the folk there not wanting blacks to swim in the pool, and a kid was hit, and a scar was still left on their face. That was Elijah Cummings at 11. We have a rich history, and I see this development as it um, wants to grow to be a really big gateway of eating more of our community. I have seen, um, it looked like, like developers to me, walk through the, uh, the townhomes where we still have blacks there. I have seen Mr. Schofer pointing at our houses some years back. This community needs to be highlighted in Baltimore City and it has been forgotten. Every black person who lives in the city needs to be proud of Sharp Letton Hall because of a lot of people, their families, generations started there and branched out. I love my community. I see what's happening and I am so upset that our council person is not hearing us. It's been like that. I'm sorry. I just hope that you all consider, this is a piece of history here. The late, the late 1700s we were here. Thank you for Thank your you. testimony. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else before we move to the developers? I think you've already spoken. You haven't? Okay, quickly, thank you. State your name. Judge uh, Jim Kidwell, and thank you for allowing me to speak. I didn't sign up, but I, I felt right. compelled to it. Um, I wanna tell you a, sh a short story. Uh, my daughter really hit it big this last period of time, and she took a whole family to Aruba for a vacation. I was so grateful. Uh, and then when we got down there, we took this tour of the island, and the biggest industry down there is the aloe factory. And so we went through the aloe factory, uh, and our guide was friends with the owner, and the owner told me that a man had walked into their, to their building, and he said, you know, I can industrialize everything that you're doing in this place and cut your workforce in half. And the owner said, why would I want to do that? I want to hire more people. And so in my almost 72 years on the planet, it's the first time that I've ever heard a businessman say that they wanted to keep people working instead of cutting it down to increase their profit. And therein lies the problem that you guys are dealing with. Businesses will never serve the community and you guys are the only ones are buffer against it. You're, you're the only ones that can hold their feet to the fire because of the fact that builders can't make a bunch of money on low income housing, they're not gonna build it. It's not gonna happen unless you guys hold their feet to the fire and say, look, enough is enough. There's plenty of housing in Baltimore, but there's not enough affordable housing and you guys gotta do something. This stuff has got to stop uh, Sharp Leaden Hall has been dumped on over the years. When I came here in 74, they were just building the highway to nowhere through that community. And the only reason it didn't get to nowhere, to somewhere, is because the residents of Fells Point, who were mostly white, got their Congressman Mikulski to stand up for them and shut it down. And so we're asking for help from you because we're not going to get it anyplace else. And I say to the developers that if you can't make more affordable housing in this neighborhood, find some other place to build. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe Woolman. So, and uh, I think you have Doug Schmidt with you. Yes, Mr. Schmidt is with me. So and I can... know you've heard a lot of testimony, yes. a lot of different stories. Yes. Um, a lot of people asking for uh, help in a sense yeah. um, and so we're interested in your response certainly and, and and first of all let me start off by by thanking miss Betty for 
for at least recognizing that we're, that we're nice guys. That, that doesn't happen very often, so we really, we really appreciate that. And I, and I think I first met Betty probably 20 years ago in her, in her living room, uh, so we go way back. So uh, we certainly appreciate that sentiment, but we also, we also appreciate the testimony from all the neighbors that, that got up and spoke. A and we appreciate the lengthy testimony at the Planning Commission back on February 9th. Um, I wish Mr. Tiza was still here so I could thank him and his staff for all their hard work on this matter. That hearing was, was almost three hours long and it provided the community a, a great opportunity to chime in on the zoning issues uh, before you. And, and it really is, I wanna point out, it really is the zoning issue uh, that's before you. I recognize there's been a lot of commentary made today uh, regarding uh, inclusionary housing, et cetera. Um, you know, this may not be necessarily the time or place uh, for an in-depth inclusionary housing debate. I know those have already occurred and I know there are more coming as, uh, as, as Odette is looking at me and nodding her head. Um, uh, so uh, with, with that in mind, I'd like to try, to try to refocus if we can because there were a couple speakers that, that mentioned legalities and mentioned courtrooms, et cetera, and I wanna make sure we have a, a strong record in this case before the council uh, because I'm hearing uh, legality and illegal, illegality thrown out there a lot. Um, so what I want to be clear about and do my job as the attorney for the developer is to uh, mirror, if you will, and recite the statement of fact, or the findings of fact, excuse me, that the Planning Commission uh, took great effort uh, to reach in their hearing. Um, I, I've submitted a document which again mirrors uh, those findings of fact uh, uh, from the Planning Commission and the planning staff, and I think it's important uh, for the record uh, to include reference to both the, ci the city zoning code as well as the state land use article, in particular 10304 and 10305 of the state land use article and section 5508 of the zoning code, all which requires the council to make findings of fact when it comes to rezoning. And I think a lot of these facts are important. And there's certainly gonna be people that disagree with some of these facts. Uh, the facts can be both objective and subjective. Uh, obviously not everybody's gonna agree with every fact, but I think the commission did a very good job of weighing all the testimony. In fact, there was even one commissioner, uh, Commissioner Previs, who admitted during the hearing that his mind was changed during the hearing. He came into the hearing predisposed against the rezoning, uh, and after hearing uh, testimony from staff in particular, and Mr. Tizo in particular, actually changed his mind, and the commission eventually voted seven to one uh, in favor of this, of this rezoning. So, uh, you know, to preserve the record, and if you'll bear with me, I'll try to read this as quickly as I can go back to my old district court prosecutor mode, but um, uh, th these is what, what I would, th this is what I would submit as the, uh, as the findings of fact uh, in, in this matter and submit them to the council for your consideration. Uh, and these are all requirements of the law, and I think it's important since the law has been brought up several times. The first, first requirement is to study the population changes. Uh, the neighborhood has seen an increase in population between 2010 and 2020, growing from 1,823 to 2,677. And again, these are the planning department's numbers, not mine. That's an almost 32% growth in population. Uh, the second requirement is, the, is to consider the availability of public facilities. Uh, the site is well served by public services and utilities which can also support redevelopment or re reuse of this site. And again, this language is from the planning staff and the planning commission's findings. Uh, the third uh, consideration is present and future transportation patterns. There are no significant changes forecasted for the area and rezoning to TOD4 now TOD3, if the council uh, committee chooses to pass the amendment uh, that we proposed at the request of the community, I would add, uh, rezoning TOD4 or TOD3 would recognize the proximity to existing light, the existing light rail station within several blocks of the property. Uh, the fourth consideration is compatibility with existing and proposed development for the area. Uh, this rezoning would require, or excuse me, would recognize the trend and changes to zoning in this neighborhood and immediately adjacent neighborhoods since the comprehensive rezoning of the city in 2017. TOD 4 or 3, zoning for this property would provide for redevelopment of this property for residential redevelopment at a density appropriate for its proximity to the light rail station. Consideration number five, the recommendation of the city agencies and officials, including the Baltimore City Planning Commission and the Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals. I've already stated the commission, after a three hour hearing, voted seven to one in favor of this bill and the BMZA deferred to the Planning Commission. 
The sixth consideration is the proposed amendments relationship to and consistency, and consistency with the city's comprehensive master plan. The proposed rezoning is compatible with the surrounding neighborhoods and retention of the existing industrial mixed use zoning is not supported by the comprehensive plan or the Department of Planning's policy. And again, this is language from, from the Planning Commission. Uh, consideration number seven, existing uses of the property within the general area of the property in question. And there are primarily residential uses in the general area. I think that probably is something we can all agree upon. Uh, consideration number eight, the zoning classification of other property within the general area of the property in question. Uh, there is a large uh, area of TOD4 zoning three blocks to the south of the property, and this was something Commissioner Previs at the Planning Commission hearing focused on uh, to, to a great degree. Uh, consideration number nine, and there's only one more after this, uh, the su suitability of the property in question for the uses permitted under its existing zoning classification. The property is currently improved with a brick warehouse building, which may be used for a, a variety of uses approvable under the current IMU1 zoning, though any use that isn't an industrial use would likely lead to redevelopment of the site. And then finally, Consideration number 10, the trend of development, if any, in the general area of the property in question, including changes, if any, that have taken place since the property in question was placed in its present classification. And again, this is language from the commission. There is a multi-block node of TOD4 zoning three blocks to the south, nearly equidistant to the south from the light rail stop. TOD zones did not exist under the former zoning code. That TOD4 node was formed from land that was previously zoned M2 industrial, B2 commercial, and OR office residential districts. This bill would be similar in recognizing that the existing industrial mixed use zoning is no longer needed to accommodate existing light industrial uses, such as warehousing, and can be updated to complement surrounding residential zones. I just wanted to, to refocus, if you will, the committee's attention to the legalities uh, before you and the issue before you as opposed to the overall debate over inclusionary housing. Planners often like to state that zoning runs with the land. And, and even though we certainly recognize that a redevelopment project of this nature is often the impetus for legislation and the reason the legislation is before you, it's still important to recognize that zoning runs with the land and a project could go away and then, the, and then you are left with that rezoning. So it's important to bear in mind the various legalities when it comes to considering a rezoning of the land. With all that being said, my client, Mr. Schmidt, is here from Workshop Development. We recognize the impetus for this legislation is a particular project. He's here to answer questions and provide some background on the project itself. Again, with the understanding that you're not here voting on a development project, you're here voting on legislation to change the underlying zoning for the land. But with that said, I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Schmidt about the project in particular, unless you have any questions for me. Any questions from committee? Moving on to Mr. Schmidt. Thank you very much. Thank you. No one wants to hear more from the lawyer. <laughs> um, I'm Doug Schmidt with Workshop Development. Um, Chairwoman Middleton, thank you so much for having me. Um, my notes are all over the place, so I'll try hard to address a number of the issues and concerns. Um, one of, of our neighbors uh, asked a question of does it matter? And the answer is, of course it matters. And there are a lot of issues today that we've heard um, that are large citywide issues of poverty, racism, displacement, and other things that certainly matter, um, but this is a project, this is one piece of land, um, and we're gonna address what we can to, to make that the best that it can and to serve the goals of the city as best it can. But I, I do think it's a little unfair to try to heap too much on top of this one project. But let me try to address a number of the issues. Um, Councilman Costello mentioned three meetings. We actually had a fourth. Um, Betty Bland Thomas asked me to come to a, a, a meeting to make sure that all the folks that uh, she knew that hadn't attend the first two meetings could, could have their uh, time to ask questions. Um, and uh, I certainly did that and was happy to. Um, and uh, a lot of additional information came out. And we wanted to make sure that all of the folks in the neighborhood, not just one particular block or area, uh, got their chance to make their comments. And, and they did. And we did make substantial changes. Their, their comments did matter. Um, the councilman talked a little bit about parking and height, shade, pet impacts, security. Um, there were many, many things that we changed. Um, and for those, I'm proud of it and we'll continue to listen. And as the project continues, there will be more meetings and more 
listening, and, um, and we will continue to evolve the project. But there are some things that also can't change, that we're just not able to change, some of the fundamental uh, parts of the project and the economics. Um, and certainly, inclusionary units at the cost of the project is one of those. And um, I've invested a lot of time in this process of um, updating the inclusionary housing legislation. I hope that there is a good outcome. I'm certainly pushing for it to happen quicker. But I think it's, it's well known now and accepted that projects cannot afford inclusionary units without additional support from the city. And so we do look forward, and for folks that said that we wouldn't do the units, we actually will, and we look forward to a program that ultimately will provide that um, support so that inclusionary units will happen. Um, we're not holding up moving ahead. We have to move ahead. We can't wait for legislation, but personally, I'm pushing to have that happen as quickly as possible. Um, there was other concerns about displacement, and I, again, I think there's concerns of gentrification and other things that, that are relevant in the city but aren't really relevant here. Um, there is no one that's supposed to be living in this building. Oh, I think there might be one person that's living there. Um, so there's no one that would be displaced. Um, this is an old, obsolete industrial building, um, and it will be all new units to, the, to uh, this neighborhood. And let me review some of the things the project will do that I think are very positive. Um, it will preserve the facade of a late 19th century manufacturing building. Um, it will clean up environmental issues with the property, some um, that are potential that we may or may not discover, others that we, we know are there, um, and, and personally I have a lot of experience with brownfield, so I assure you it will be done to the letter of the law and in the book, and, and what we'll get on the outs, uh, at the end of the project will be a much cleaner, better, safer site. Um, we'll be removing an industrial use from a residential neighborhood that has no reason for tractor trailers and other trucks to be there. Um, we will create jobs for local contractors and workers temporarily and then permanent jobs for our, our staff. Um, we'll be reducing runoff and improving water quality with modern stormwater management, green roofs, street trees, landscaping. Um, and we'll be, we will be bringing new residents to our city, which I think is, it's, it's not uh, the only thing that's important. It's not a um, growth at all costs, but certainly it is a big value. Um, in that neighborhood, uh, currently adjacent to our property, there's 191 affordable units in the Sharp Leadenhall Apartments. That includes a six-story building as part of that development. Um, and uh, there are for sale townhouses. And as of today, there was only one available market rate rental per Zillow and Apartments.com, a $3,400 a month townhouse. So our 165 units, approximately, that, that will be all new to the market, not displacing or taking one other unit away, um, will be at an, a different price point and a different option, which should add more options for folks that want to live in that area. Um, um, so I think in that way, this project will make things better for everyone. It'll be more secure. It'll be uh, more environmentally friendly. It'll be um, have more street cover or more tree cover. Um, we'll be removing meters, so there should be more parking. So I think it is a win-win, but again, it's not gonna solve all problems for everyone. And then lastly, just so people understand the numbers, um, with us utilizing city tax credits, this building will generate approximately $25 million in additional real estate and resident piggyback income tax over the next two decades. And these are new dollars that are desperately needed to fund existing city services and other social priorities. So um, the opposite of uh, disinvestment is investment, and that's what Baltimore needs, and that's what we're committed to doing on this project. Thank you. Any questions before we move to public testimony? The, oh, it, from committee, we still have um, Councilman Stokes. Real quick, um, I heard the word racism. I heard the word disinvestment. I grew up in a 1700 block of Preston Street. My mother had eight children, two sets of twins. I watched our neighborhood go from home ownership to vacancy. I watched an organization in East Baltimore move 700 black people out of East Baltimore. I watched inclusionary housing expire. But when I go to Dolly Park, when I go to South Clifton Park, when I go to Greater Greenmount, those poor black neighborhoods and those seniors that live next door to four houses next to them that don't nobody live in, they can't even afford it. They got vacant houses, a dirty yard, it's toxic. 
So I don't know where inclusionary housing came in at, because when I go to those neighborhoods, inclusionary housing excluded black people in this city, especially them neighborhoods. So until inclusionary housing go in them poor black neighborhoods where they still struggling, with eight houses, we talk about affordable housing, in my, some of my part of my district, it ain't no affordable housing. You know why? Because they all vacancy. And that's the disinvestment, the racism in this city, until inclusionary housing go into those neighborhoods in my community and help my people, I'm not supporting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Councilman. The committee will now take public testimony. And we have, I see um, one person. Just a reminder, if you're online and would like to testify on this bill, please use the raise hand button to let us know. And we'll start with Barbara Samuels. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, um, I've submitted some, uh, yes, we do have your testimony in writing for the committee. Yes, Did you testimony that I, I think um, sets out why the um, facts in this case and the findings of the Planning Commission are um, not do not support the legal test for spot zoning in Maryland. So I won't repeat those except to point out that there is no evidence of a change in the conditions since 2017 in that neighborhood. And the Planning Commission tied itself up in knots trying to find um, a change that would justify uh, a, the required finding of a change in conditions. And frankly, um, did a pretty unconvincing job of it as Commissioner Stevenson pointed out with his no vote. Um, but the, the other thing I would just mention is that this is not a decision between whether there should be development or not, whether there should be apartments or not. The current IMU1 zoning permits as a matter of right uh, apartments to be built, approximately 139 apartments, <clears throat> approximately 60 feet of height, and that can go forward as is. So what the developer is asking the city to do here is to give him a valuable rezoning that would generate more units, more profit, and more tax credits for him. He has not ever said, and he didn't say today, that the project is infeasible at 139 units. And so the council can defeat this bill, can vote against this bill, and it does not mean that there will be uh, no investment going into that neighborhood. It doesn't mean that there won't be piggyback property taxes paid by residents going into that neighborhood. What it would do, however, for the council to take, to take a no vote would be to show that the council is serious about equity and inclusive development, and especially in Baltimore's most historic black community. Because if development can run roughshod over Sharp Leadenhall, it can run roughshod in any community. And the fact that uh, there was prior TOD zoning approved in the Cross Street Corridor, which is actually an entirely separate part of this neighborhood, divided by institutional uses, is not, it, it was a mistake, probably. <laughs> but it is not a justification for further spreading the, the gentrification into this part of Sharp, Sharp Leadenhall. And I'm not one to, to cry gentrification uh, in Baltimore very often. We, we need development in, in Baltimore, and I think everybody that you've heard from today has said that. <clears throat> and we need development in black neighborhoods of Baltimore. Uh, but what we need is equitable development. And this development is not equitable. It is the developer asking for additional profit at the expense of the neighbors to be bestowed by the city without giving anything back, without showing any respect whatsoever for the um, master plan for Sharp Leaden Hall, which is a city official city document posted on the Planning Commission website 
and which had the foresight to require affordability in all future development in Sharp Leadenhall. So to, to give this uh, intensive TOD zoning, which would be a virtual blank check to the developer under these conditions, is not supported by law and it is certainly not supported by equity. And so I would urge you all to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. That was the only um, raised that was the only raised hand. And now we're checking for see if there were any phone calls. And we see no phone callers. Uh, does the committee have any comments or questions at this point? Uh, yes, Councilman Bullock. Uh, so again, uh, thank everybody for being here today. Um, I, <clears throat> I have some questions. I'm a bit conflicted, but I do want to ask um, to the council member of uh, the sponsor a question because I'm seeing a lot of the neighborhood opposition and folks who live in proximity. Um, uh, Councilman Costello, do, do you have um, a group of folks or any other individuals who live in proximity who are supportive of, of the project? I'm just curious. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, yes, there's a number of residents who reached out to voice their support. Um, in those three public hearings, um, or the three public meetings that I held, um, there was support, albeit there was more opposition uh, at those meetings, uh, but there have been a number of neighbors who have vocalized their support for this project. Thank you, uh, Councilman and Madam Chair. And, and then one follow-up to that, because I think the other thing that's coming up is, is really just the people who are living like really in close proximity. And I know there seems to be a divide in terms of the neighborhoods versus Sharp Leading Hall and then Otterbein. Do, do you give a, a, a kind of an idea in terms of the support in Sharp Leading Hall versus Otterbein, or is it kind of equal to your? Um, so the, the property is bounded by um, Peach, Leadenhall, West Henrietta, and West Montgomery, also known as Little Montgomery, the 100 block. Um, the directly adjacent properties are all in Otterbein, so that, that city block, um, which while it's, it's cut through by Peach Street, is, um, I think as the planning department would, would acknowledge is entirely in Otterbein. Um, that obviously has changed over the years, and a big part of that was the Dollar House program and the homestead in Otterbein in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, but I would say, you know, my best guess is it, it's mixed between both. Um, and one more, Madam Chair. And, and th this is either a developer or um, council member or both can, can address this. So in, in terms of what we're hearing today about that, the IMU versus then going to the TOD, can you talk about what the difference would be in terms of the development now versus what would it be in terms of the rezoning and why this seems to be something you would like to see? I would defer to land use council for the, the developer on that. Please, you can please step up. State your name again. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Council uh, Member Bullock, for the question. Again, my name is Joe Woolman. I'm a local land use attorney. So when we were studying the property uh, and the restrictions under the IMU-1 zoning, it became readily apparent that in order, in order to make this project work and, and save the two facades, which I would remind you were, were, were taking great pains and efforts and expense to save the historic facades, it became abundantly clear that we, that we did need uh, the zoning to be changed from the IMU one simply because of the, uh, the lack of density, uh, the, the desire the planning department shared with us for higher density for TOD zoning. Uh, if you're going to take advantage of transit, and there is a light rail station only a couple blocks away, uh, uh, city planners will tell you they prefer a higher density. Mr. Tizo even testified to that at the planning commission hearing. So we're not looking to maximize uh, either the TOD4 or the TOD3 zoning. As, am as amended, it would be TOD3, and I think Mr. Tizo, way back when this hearing started, was, te was testifying about the differences between the intensity of uses. 
Uh, we heard at one of our final uh, community meetings uh, very loud and clearly uh, that there were a lot of concerns about some of the uses uh, that TOD4 uh, allowed. Um, and recognizing that this is a residential project, we were willing to take a look at, at downzoning, if you will, from TOD4 to TOD3. So that's the reason why that amendment has been introduced. Uh, but again, we're not looking to maximize the height. Uh, we're six stories. Uh, we can all differ as to what a high rise is. I don't think this would necessarily qualify as a, as a high rise apartment building. Um, uh, but in order to do uh, the project that, that worked for my client, and we'll be read, readily transparent and, and, and honest that you know, a project needs to work. Um, they're not in this to, to, to lose money. They're not in it to, to necessarily just look to make a lot of money. They want to improve the city. These are local developers. I've lived in this area in South Baltimore for 20 years. This developer has done a lot of great work in the city. Uh, and I know, and, and Mr. Schmidt can speak to this further and probably a lot better than I can, but they're looking to do a project that makes sense. Uh, they're working with a local architect who, who uh, works in the city a lot. Um, and we look forward to continuing to communicate with the community. Despite all the opposition we have, uh, Mr. Schmidt has committed to continue to work uh, with the neighbors and the associations as the project moves forward. Um, so again, we're, I think we're talking about 70 feet, is that correct? Uh, in terms of the heights, we're not looking to maximize the 100 foot uh, height allowance that TOD 4 or 3 uh, would allow. But again, IMU 1, for a variety of reasons, including the ones I stated from the Planning Commission, uh, just doesn't work for the site. And more importantly, it does potentially permit certain industrial uses, which the planning staff and we certainly feel wouldn't be appropriate for this mostly residential neighborhood. Madam Chair, may uh, I please add yes. to that response? Um, I should note that the current zoning of the property does permit um, certain commercial uses that the community has voiced opposition to. It's just an add-on to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilwoman Ramos. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have two other questions. One is, um, can you tell us a little bit about your plan, the, the timeline um, that you're thinking about? So once this is uh, potentially passed and you're doing, I'm assuming you're working with the community on design and, you know, all of those things, uh, what is your timeline? I, I think Mr. Schmidt would be more equipped to answer that better than I can, so I'll have him come step up. Mr. Smith, as you did say, you were um, looking forward to more meetings and more listening, <laughs> so that timeline is and more testimony. she's asking um, for. Yes, hi, I'm Doug Schmidt with Workshop Development. Um, so we have been to uh, UDAP once. Um, we will be going back, and then we will uh, head to SPRC. So I think realistically where we are, particularly on um, some of the uh, site design, we'd be at least a year out from the start of construction. Um, uh, but you know that, that that'll evolve over time. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Um, and then the second um, question I had was, um, I'm uh, feel a little bit better now that you've said that it really is literally two feet above what you're allowed under IMU. IMU allows you 68. I, th um, my, I think IMU is 60. I don't believe that was modified, but I'm not 100% sure. Pretty sure we changed it to 68. Um, but, but part of the, the challenge is to, we really were trying to respond not only to the building, um, and our architect was involved in um, helping us uh, look at whether the IMU would work for what was best for the site or not. Um, and we also wanted to pull the top of the building inwards and set it back, not only for the aesthetics, but also to be sensitive to the neighbors. And so uh, the building ha needed that six story to be able to pull units away. Um, could we have squeezed something into IMU that maybe, but the unit count is important too, so it, it most likely was not viable and it certainly wouldn't be as attractive um, as, as I think what we've proposed. And so the design that you've um, proposed with the, with the 70 feet or six stories, um, is that is there a written agreement that you're working on with the community about all of the community benefits that they have um, listed and and would also you know sort of scope out that this is what you're going for and that you won't be going for the full hundred feet? Um, so we have had a number of discussions with the community about um, concerns they've had and and there was um, discussions of trying to you know at this at an early stage um, have us make certain 
um, requirements in writing, some of them related to construction, um, which most of those, of those concerns are covered by our um, MOT that we'll have as part of our development process. Um, and I also urge them to come and, and listen to our UDAP meetings so they could understand a little bit more about where we're going on design. Um, so we are working through those issues with them. We're not at the point, and, and frankly, I don't think it'll be really necessary to have any sort of binding agreement. Um, we'll be um, going through UDAP, as I said, we'll do our site plan review, and then we'll be submitting for permit, and that'll be as much building as we can build. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, I just wanted to uh, remind uh, the committee and the audience that, um, because it came up, that the inclusionary requirement is both that there has to be a public subsidy um, in order for this to kick in, uh, the inclusionary requirement, and that the requirement starts the minute that a permit is filed. Okay, so it's not, it's, it, that's when it starts, is that's our proposal um, at, at, the, at the moment in the bill. So just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that timing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, also, Mr. Smith, I know you had mentioned um, that you're, there was an interest in jobs and acquiring local jobs and that um, this particular project, um, there has not been any displacement Correct. Did you, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the, uh, do you have a plan on how you're going to implement those jobs? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so at this, so we recently finished a project in Highland Town um, and our contractor is local and our, our primary subs were local. So at this point we haven't selected our subs, but our intent is because we, we've had a really good team to use that same group. Um, and particularly now as construction is easing, um, I know they're anxious to keep their, their folks working. Um, and as far as displacement, um, I think you, you, you heard me mention a little bit about the character of what's immediately around the project, the, the um, current housing stock. So as I said, this was an industrial building that's been there for, for a very long time. It, it says 1899 on the top. I'm hoping that's when it was built because it's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and as I said, there's, there's no one lived there, no one has ever lived there. So I think um, it is all net new um, units. Uh, the, my, I'm, I'm no expert on the project across the street that has affordable units, but um, the, this project would have no impact on whatever their obligations and their business plan is, nor would it have an impact on the for sale houses around it. So as I said, we, we believe that we're adding more options to the market and, um, and more opportunities for folks to live there. So it should be a net new. Thank you, uh, Council, Councilman Conway. Uh, and just to be clear, and I think you said this uh, in your earlier statement, you, you are trying to figure out how to do affordable housing within this project. It sounds like because we haven't worked out all the finances and structure of the deal, that's still up for consideration. Is that correct? Uh, so within the current, under the current rules, and um, without additional support from the city, um, the project will be market rate. Now within that, um, this is not designed to be a uh, Harbor East glass tower from a price point or a design. So the, the word luxury is thrown out a lot. I guess there's different levels of, of luxury. Um, so th within that neighborhood for a brand new project based on what it costs, um, the rents will be reasonable. Uh, the units generally are, are relatively small and that's for efficiency and to try to be as competitive as possible on the rents and offer to as many folks as, as we can. Got it, thank you. Any other um, comments or questions from the committee? Hearing none, uh, okay. The committee heard testimony and recommendations to support the legal standards and findings. And um, I do have a, an amendment that you all have a copy of and um, I'm offering that amendment, and it says on page one, in lines five to 14, in each instance, strike TOD4 and sub substitute TOD3. Is there a motion to recommend this amendment? So moved. So moved by Councilman Bullock and second by um, Stokes. Oh. We have to call the vote? Okay. 
for the amendment. Um, Chair Middleton, yes. Bullock? Yes. Is a yes. Conway? Yes. Is a yes. Dorsey, yes. absent. Glover? Yes. Is a yes. Ramos? Yes. Is a yes. And Stokes? Yes. Is a yes. Is there a motion to recommend the bill favorable? As amended? So moved. So moved by uh, Stokes, second. To move the bill favorable as amended? Who was that? The second by Conway. Yes. Um, point of order, do we, do we have to adopt the findings of fact, or does the committee have to adopt the findings of fact? Yes, we do, D don't we? No, the council adopts them. Okay. The council adopts them. Oh, on the, on the floor? On the floor. Got it, thank you. Okay. Okay, is there a motion to um, move this bill as amended? And we already did that. <laughs> so that's it. Okay, we're voting again. Um, Ma Madam Chair, j just to uh, be certain, if you would indulge me, um, w would you consider adoption of the findings of, of fact? Yes, we could. Let's Thank vote you, on Chair. the. We're, um, the sponsor asked for a vote on the findings of fact. Um, and Chair Middleton says yes. Bullock? Yes. I think you need a motion. We, I, need a, <laughs> I make a motion to adopt the findings of facts. We usually just do a yay or nay, but you want a roll call. Is correct? Chair Middleton, yes. Bullock? Yes. Is a yes. Conway? is a yes, Dorsey absent, Glover yes. is a yes, Ramos? Yes, can I explain my vote? Yes. Thank you. Um, we're adopting the finding of the facts, just uh, basically laying out what exactly was uh, the Planning Commission said. Correct. Um, I will say that I do think that we need to take a look, maybe in this committee or through another bill uh, of TOD, because we don't have a defined distance right now as to like, where the project is versus where public transportation is and what that looks like. So absent of that, I will vote yes on, on this, this uh, finding of the facts, but it's something that I think we should think about. Thank you. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, Stokes, and I already yeah. did you. Okay. So now we need to make the motion to move the bill as amended favorable, correct? Chair Middleton, yes. I need to make, I like to make the motion to move the bill recommended uh, as amended, favorable as amended. So moved by Stokes. Second? Or Stokes, are you seconding what I just said? You're seconding to what I just said. Okay, let's take the vote. Stokes. Let me um, explain my vote, and I'm going to say it, and I don't say nothing that I don't say now and say all the time. Until inclusionary housing include my neighborhoods where my seniors live at, we talking about inclusionary housing, and they live next door to vacant houses in a district, and they seniors, and until I'm going to keep saying it, because I don't bite my tongue, if inclusionary housing don't include black poor neighborhoods where racism, where disinvestment has been. We talking about affordable housing, and they live next door. One side of the, the house is empty, four. The other side, four empty houses. And we come talking about inclusionary housing. When I go to Darley Park, which I share with uh, Councilman Ramos, when I go to Broadway East, where I share with uh, Councilman uh, Glover, when I go to South Clifton Park, when I go to Greater Greenmount, and we sit here talking about inclusionary housing and these racist policies, housing policies in this city, and you want to come back and include race, inclusionary housing where? 
They must have skipped on over a lot of black poor neighborhoods. That's what happened. Now we back here talking about it. It's sunset. Well, show me where it worked in poor black neighborhoods right now. Now we back here talking about we want inclusionary housing. It didn't even work the first time. You know why them neighborhoods I just named? Y'all call it inclusionary. I call it exclusionary. I was here at the second meeting, and I said, let me take you to Darley Park and South Clifton Park and Broadway East and show you where inclusionary housing did absolutely nothing. And we back here having the same conversation. When you talk about equity, it's a dis uh, developers in my district, they got 700 pieces of property. I got two African-American females that have their CDC. You know what they told them? We can't do that. So the caller talked about equity. Inclusionary housing has absolutely no equity to it. So my vote is yes. Councilwoman Ramos. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to explain my vote. Um, first, I want to just mention to my colleague that uh, it is true. The inclusionary law that we had in the past did not work. That is why we are back at the drawing board to try to make it work and that our bill actually goes citywide. That's what our new bill does. Um, secondly, uh, I am really struggling uh, with this vote on um, this particular project. Um, I uh, am hopeful that our, our law will pass so that we will see inclusionary units in um, this development. Um, so, and that, you know, I'm gonna be looking at the, at the TOD um, as well. Um, so I am struggling uh, very much with this vote. Um, but I also know that uh, we have a lot uh, that we can do here and that I'm hopeful that we can get inclusionary units um, once our bill um, passes. So <clears throat> I'm voting yes. Thank you for your vote. And, and with, on that note, I will go ahead and do my vote as well before I move on. Um, and I um, agree with you, Councilwoman Ramos, and uh, Council, Councilman Stokes, you have, you know, mentioned some good, very good points as well. And uh, as Councilwoman Ramos had mentioned, and we know that the Councilwoman is very strong supporter and advocate for inclusionary housing, and we have had problems in the city with just trying to get that moving. And um, th th this is a hard vote, I think, for all of us on this committee. Um, but we have to stick to this particular committee is clearly about um, the zoning of this property. And as we have been looking over the notes, and we know that a lot of time is spent in trying to put this together. and. The developers have been taking their time with this. There was a three-hour planning commission. The sp um, sponsor of the bill did several cancellations just to try to move this forward and get a consensus around the whole area. And it is a clear example of many of the problems that we have throughout the city. And I'm hoping that the developers um, really stand by their word and really listen to what you heard. And this can be a, an example of the improvements that we need to have around this entire city. Um, knowing that there's not going to be any displacement on this particular project, a lot of people were mentioning um, you know, the poverty that we have and how uh, this city has really has a lot of racism and it continues. But we, we have to stay focused on the particular th emphasis and the emphasis has been on the zoning and everything has been clearly laid out with, with no mistakes. So my vote is a yes and I move on to Councilman Bullock. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you to everybody who came out today. Um, I will admit, like one of my colleagues, Councilman Ramos mentioned, I'm deeply conflicted um, at this moment. Um, just hearing from some of the folks in the neighborhood who have talked about just their uh, perceptions of the project. Um, again, we've saw, heard a lot about inclusionary housing. We know that's that's not necessarily what this um, bill is about today in terms of the planning piece. And so as a planner, I look at, you know, what we're talking about in terms of, in terms of zoning. Uh, so I totally understand that. It's part of the reason why I ask those questions around um, IMU um, versus uh, TOD. Um, again, to, to, to those who came today, and I think there were some who were questioning the process, um, even as I'm talking right now, I'm still working through this process, right? Um, because again, there's a lot of information and the hearing from folks who live directly adjacent from it, but then also thinking about uh, what this means in terms of the future, the mix of housing, the mix of, of, of uses here. Again, it's, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a struggle, but um, uh, at, at this point, I am going to vote um, in favor. However, what I will say, um, we have to be very um, intentional around what it means for neighborhood development and, and how we engage with neighborhood leaders. Um, I was a little bit troubled in terms of you know what folks felt like the communication was. I was encouraged also seeing you two sit next to each other and talk about um, some of the things I kind of observe what was going on there. Um, I do appreciate those who came out today, but you know, my vote is going to be yes. Councilman Conway. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I, may I explain my vote? Yes. Um, I, I, I won't go into long detail echo, echoing the same sentiments of my colleagues. I, I agree uh, with a lot of what was said before me, um, understanding the nuance of this decision, um, specifically being that this is a zoning uh, bill, this is a zoning hearing, this is a zoning conversation, but has real implications for affordable housing. Um, and inclusionary housing. Um, we have work to do on this council. We have unfinished business that we need to settle. Um, I, unfortunately, this is not the place to settle it, uh, not on this particular project, not in this way. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I would love to see an honest effort by the developer to find a way to make sure that there are affordable units. Um, that said, I think we should do everything within our power to make sure that we, we get this bill that's been out there for some time now uh, across the finish line in a sensible way. Um, I realize that uh, inclusionary housing is a, it's a, it's a difficult topic for which I've learned way more than I ever intended to as a legislator. Um, and I want to thank my colleague for bringing it forward uh, with all the gusto that she has. Um, I appreciate the nuance of these projects and the affordability of these projects um, and some of the work that we've done uh, with recent legislation tied to affordability, um, the inclusionary housing bill that make even the prospect of what we're still battling over potentially possible. Um, so I, I appreciate the nuance and why we haven't necessarily cracked that nut for this particular project. Um, that said, um, you know, I want to see an honest effort, if at all possible, to make it happen. Um, and to that end, my vote is yes. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilman Glover. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I kind of piggyback off many of my colleagues. I uh, listened to Councilman Robert Stokes, who uh, he and I share pretty much the same um, when it comes to uh, district-wise, uh, the constituents that we represent. Uh, I have conversations with our uh, colleague Odette Ramos in reference to um, inclusionary housing, which I'm still uh, uh, learning, but I think this is the opportunity for the developers um, to be a pilot um, and to set an example for other developments that developers that come behind you um, to show that we're going to get it done. And once you get it done, the other developers will follow behind you. So I think this is a great opportunity for you to get the work done so we can move Baltimore forward and bring back its charm. So uh, I'm voting yes. Thank you, Councilman Glover. And Councilman Dorsey is absent. And um, before we, this um, bill has passed and we'll move to second reader. And before we close out, um, I think all of us have just can't reiterate over and over again to the developers, please um, continue to have meetings with this with the community. Um, 
this is just a very important subject, and um, as we all said and all and said and all in agreement that this could be an example of how you can really work with um, how we can build this inclusionary the inclusionary housing efforts. Um, and I'll, before we close out, if, if there's any final comments from the sponsor of the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do want to thank everyone who's participated in the several community forums that we've held, the folks who, many of you who are here today who participated in the Planning Commission, um, participated in today's hearing. Um, and as I've said before, uh, the expectations that I've laid out for the development team, my expectation is these are gonna be our neighbors and that they continue to engage um, with the surrounding community uh, to make this a, the best possible project it can be for our community. So again, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to everyone who attended and participated today. Thank you all, and thank you all for taking your time to attend the hearing, and this meeting hearing is adjourned.